Hundreds of employees at the Environmental Protection Agency have been advised they're at risk of losing their job. 618 now, the Environmental Protection Agency continues to downsize under the Trump administration. The agency says it will eliminate about 500 positions in its Office of Research and Development. The EPA has lost about 3,700 staffers so far since President Trump took office. Hey everyone, my name is Randy Lee and I'm an environmental engineer. When I see headlines like this or that, I get scared for our future. I know especially if you're interested in this field, it'll make you wonder, am I going to get a job? How long will that take? Or am I really making the right choice for my future career? So if you click this video, you're probably curious or are actively looking for an environmental related job. You hear bad news like these, seeing companies and jobs that are just laying off people or cutting jobs completely related to helping the environment. And so why would you dare start searching for a job when you know the writing's on the wall? Is now really a good time to look? I mean, you're basically running into a burning building. But I wanna give you my honest opinion. During times like these, when there are just less and less people working in this field, it just means that there's less demand, right? But less demand doesn't mean that there are less problems. If anything, the opposite is true. Once you like fire all the guys who are working there to keep the problem controlled, now you're just going to have an even bigger problem in the future. Meaning water quality isn't going to fix itself, air isn't going to get any cleaner, pollution is still like an ongoing problem and will only just keep getting worse as we continue to do like business as usual. So the problem is that it will eventually catch up to us in the future. So even though you see all these headlines that jobs are being cut, I know it sounds pretty counterintuitive, but now is probably the best time to start searching and diving to this career. And I say this as someone who has been told their entire life during college from friends and family that this is just like a horrible decision for me, that there's like no money to be made and that this is just like a useless degree no one really cares about the environment, and if that were the case, then why do so many people all around the world have good intentions? Honestly, why do I even have an audience that are viewing these videos? Why are there environmental regulations and policy makers to begin with? And most of the people who said that probably went to like technology and computer science, but even right now, I don't believe that the job market is sustainable in that field either. For them, it's pretty overly saturated at this point, and they're probably being threatened to be replaced by AI. So if anything, they have it way worse than me and they're competing against an even larger and more disruptive job market compared to my field. This environmental field has never really been popular. With the environment, you can't really put a price tag on human and environmental health because, you know, we're all intertwined in a way. It's a known fact that the environment affects us humans' lives. So, you know, bad air probably means bad health for us as we breathe. AI and robots, they don't need to breathe but we do. And that's why I'm not so worried about us going away anytime soon. So I'm pitching you the idea that it's still safe to get in. Albeit, I know this political environment isn't making it any easier. You know, once this administration is done and people start looking at the damage that's been done, they're gonna revert back to the old ways and what is right. So everyone can agree that the environment will affect us somehow in the future. And all those conspiracy tropes about the world being heavily polluted and just like seeing a bleak future, having like, you know, waste going to a running river, all that could be true. Great, all right, so now you're convinced. So what do you do? How do you get started? So full disclosure, I still have my job as an environmental engineer. I didn't get laid off, so there is still resilience in this field. In the end, I'm not going anywhere. Here's what I would do in a situation that I just don't have a job anymore, or if you're just in general looking for an environmental engineering or environmental related field. So there are some unconventional methods that I will put out in this video, but it'll make you stand out. The first one obviously is to fix your resume. I know it sounds very obvious that you're going to use your resume to apply to a job, but let's be more specific. So with AI, ChatGPT, and other automated stuff just being incorporated into daily life and work life, you should take advantage and know that more than likely a non-human being, like some robot AI thing, is probably gonna be screening your resume. So it'll probably go through some screening with the ro robot before it gets to a human HR person. And it's most likely going to be looking for some keywords in your resume to see if it relates to the job description and your responsibilities. So that means you gotta fight fire with fire. So what that means is that you're going to have to tailor your resume to check some boxes that the job description has. And that means that you're gonna have to write your resume, you know, just start off basically, and then throw some ideas and then go to some 
resume AI bot online and say something like, here's what I currently have that you provided, and then copy and paste your resume that you have. Type in also, here's the job description and its responsibilities. So then you'd copy and paste what the job description is on that website from the employer. Then tell the AI bot, rewrite my resume by tailoring what I already have written down to match the job description and make it stand out more. You know, just don't quote me on that prompt, but it'll do its magic. Shuffle the resume bot, spits out your revised resume, just proofread it to make sure that it, you know, it makes sense. And then throw in some human intervention in a way. Make sure that it looks like it was written by you. So just do your due diligence on that part. I mean, it's obvious when a robot writes it and when a human writes it. I'm not saying you should purposely throw in some grammatical errors, but you can tell whether a person made it or not. And for the most part, this step should correct all your grammatical errors and make it so that you at least stay on topic to what you're applying for. And proofreading it with your human eyes is just the final extra details and extra touches. The second advice I'd give, apply to jobs that you are underqualified for. So yes, you heard me right. The premise is that you should already be applying to many jobs because you're sort of desperate to find work at this point. But sometimes people who apply to these lower tier jobs really lowball themselves. Meaning they apply to jobs that they know they are overqualified for. So for example, you have 10 years of experience and you apply to an entry level job. That shows a sign of desperation and it really doesn't help. I mean, I get that you really want a job, but in the end, you know that that pay isn't what you want and the work probably is just too easy for you since you've had so many years of experience. And you know that you'll probably leave once you find something better. And you know, if it pays higher. So just think about it through the eyes of a company hiring you. Do you really think that they don't know you're desperate? Of course they do. Do you really think that they'll pay you more since you have lots of experience? No, they know you'll take anything so they can offer you less. And lastly, do you really think that you'll stay long-term? Because in the end, they're gonna waste some time training you. No, they want someone who will stay there for the long-term. So when they see your name in that pool of candidates, I have a feeling they're going to choose someone who is probably a fresh graduate who is less experienced because they know in a way they can exploit that less experienced person compared to you. All I have to say is you applying to a job where you are overqualified will not help you. So if you have a PhD applying to a minimum wage job, I guarantee you they will not consider you because they know that you will leave right away for something better. And it is obvious when someone is desperate, so you should have some dignity and value yourself more because someone else will dictate what you're worth. I say this because personally at my job, we see it. And there are some hiring managers who would probably prefer someone with less experience for a job that matches them. In a way, you're competing against hundreds of applicants in a low value job, meaning that one job that you think is just maybe too high for you is probably not getting so many applicants. Probably because the same people, those you know applicants, they're thinking the same thing. They're saying it's unattainable, so why should I even apply? But sometimes because literally no one applies, no one will get it or they'll give it to someone because they need someone too. Like they need someone immediately. And because of that, in a way, you have your own advantage to that because also the employer is desperate to find and fill in that seat. Then you, even though you're not experienced or you don't have what they're looking for, they probably are more likely to look into someone rather than get nothing at all. The third one is to have good interview skills and be personable. I know this one's going to be very subjective and difficult to say, you know, just be good at something because that's easier said than done. But once you made it past that initial screening on paper, you have to face the in-person that interview. Now I know hiring managers are all different. You will have some introverts, you'll have some extroverts. You know, some are old, grumpy and boring and some are young and lively and happy. Some may start with some technical questions, meaning you really have to know your stuff and do your research. And some could just all be behavioral questions. That I can't say what will happen. You just have to prepare for all of it and wish for the best, hoping that you know you have they ask your strong suits. But what I can tell you is that everyone speaking to you is a human. So you just have to know what makes them happy. Everyone will always be happy if you remember their first name. Everyone loves like a welcoming smile and someone who is friendly and just speaks clearly and easy to speak with. I mean, that comes with practice and sometimes you have to flip the switch if you are an introvert like me. Overall, you do just have to be spatially aware and read the room. 
if it seems like you had a good time, then you probably have a higher chance of getting a job compared to when you know someone is just not smiling, just looks bored out of their mind. You can obviously tell if you didn't get the job within like five to 10 minutes of the interview. And if that's the case, at least end it with like an open-minded, thought-provoking question. So you can at least end it with a bang. Personally, I know when I don't get a job. So what I do, at least to make a lasting impression, is to ask each person interviewing a more relatable, down-to-earth question, such as, what type of skill on the job do you now incorporate into your daily life? Just something that relates to the job and their personal life. So it flips the switch and makes the interviewer think. And if it's like a really good question, it makes them think about you, if anything, and your critical thinking skills. So in a way, just by doing this, it makes them be put on a spotlight, but not like in a bad way. They'll just make them remember you more so. So even if you didn't get the job, at least they realize, wow, that person might have been a good candidate if we didn't already have one in mind. Fourth is connect like crazy. Some people say it's not what you know, it's who you know. In a way, I do agree that these connections will help you. The job that I have right now, like I didn't know anyone. Sometimes companies and hiring managers, they take a risk and a leap of faith to hire someone that they don't know. But of course, if they did hear about you beforehand, you're probably going to increase your chances of getting the job. So they already have like a vetted recommendation from someone who can say this person's you know, pretty good at working. So that can help you dramatically. So just reach out and connect with people. You don't even have to know them personally. You can just reach out to them through like email and just be friendly. For example, search someone on the job through LinkedIn or some other platform. Just introduce yourself very friendly and generally and say that you are interested in this company and this job. So do this in like a friendly way, not in an annoying way. I know it could sound annoying. It just shows that you are willing to put yourself out there. But of course, Someone could interpret this in an annoying way and just delete your email. But hey, at least you tried. I guarantee you, someone will notice and probably pull some strings, especially if you are sending like hundreds of emails. As long as you're aware that, you know, the other 99% will just delete your email, you only need that like 1% to help you out. I'm very sure if someone will read the email, they might feel a bit bad or, you know, empathetic and they'll, they'll try to do something for you. And lastly, you know, worst case scenario, you just wait it out and get more qualifications or schooling. So if all else fails, you just wait it out right now. I know the job market is pretty bad and you just have to wait for it. The current administration is only around for four years. I know it might sound like a long time, but if you've gone through and completed college, then you know that those four years, they don't last forever. So this too shall pass. So in the meantime, just go search for other qualifications and do what you can to help your resume and just gain experience. Four years, it's gonna pass no matter what. So you might as well do something productive. There are some free or low cost online courses that can help you know, make you stand out or just go volunteer somewhere for free or internship with an organization. Just do something that you enjoy and will help you release some stress. But if you need like money right away, then just pick up a part-time job and just develop those like soft skills. Soft skills meaning like customer service. Customer service jobs, they're not the greatest jobs, but just having that thick skin and professional mindset on how you would like handle situations, that can really go a long way. It builds skills that you didn't even know that you had. It just comes out naturally because you've been doing it for a long time at you know this part-time job. So it does stay with you the rest of your life. Okay, so those are the more unconventional ways that I'd give advice to myself if I were to get laid off. So I understand that times are tough, but you'll get through this eventually. Just think that as everything gets destroyed economically and environmentally, more problems will just mean more engineers are needed. So it's self-harm and counterintuitive, but it's a known cycle. Someone just has to ruin it, but once they do, they'll have to pay someone to fix it, and that's where we come in. And that's the good thing about it, after all is said and done, you will get a job just because there is so much to fix in the future. Yes, there's still potential in this career path. You may not see it, maybe none of your friends or family will see it, but I know we see it. That's all I have for now. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.